हरे हरे राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे Krishna Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare 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 
Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. You heard that before? Hmm? Have you heard that melody before? No. Pretty Christmas today. <laughs> <laughs> I just started singing it on the way out here. Um, that was just a melody that popped into my head last year. That we used to chant that sometimes at these evening programs and then I was just singing on the way over here. Yeah, it does sound Christmassy, doesn't it? Based on anything? Based on any other thing? The, um, everything's based on something. I'm just not sure where what it's based on. I mean, sounds familiar, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. You've heard it before? Mm -hmm. I was to the too. Probably the same chords to the too. Maybe. Maybe. Yes. Sounds a little Celtic, doesn't it? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Anyway, so welcome everyone. Today is Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah, and um, may your new year not be as bad as this one. No, only kidding. Um, everybody seems to think 2016 was a bad year, but if you're Krishna conscious, then you can make every year a good year. So um, before we begin, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the nature of Christmas and why Christmas is today what it is. And many people at Christmas time become depressed because it's a time for family. Yeah, sometimes they don't have family or they just look at their life and their life doesn't look good, so they become unhappy. Um, and now I think, I guess Christmas has kind of entered into um, India because on Facebook, so many Indians were sending Christmas cards and so, et cetera. So, Traditionally, the Brahmins ruled the military class or the ruling class. They were the rulers of the rulers. And the Brahmins were detached. So they did nothing to gain by giving advice to rulers. So that's why they were qualified to give. Because if you ask somebody advice, but they want to get something from you, do you think you're going to get good advice? You know, it might be contaminated advice. Yeah, I think you should do this. And just, you know, go to India for six months and I'll stay in your house and give me the keys to your car and your credit card. And I think it's a great idea. Right? So, if you get advice from someone who has nothing to gain from you, then their advice will be in your interest. So that was a Brahman. That's the Brahman. But why could they have no interest? In, in, in anything other than other people because they were beyond the modes of nature. At least they were in the mode of goodness. So in the mode of goodness, everything you do is done for the right reason. And the mode of passion, you might do something 
That's right, but you'll do it for the wrong reason. You'll do it because you want to get something. You could be doing the exact same thing. So I give you the same advice that the Brahmin gives, but a completely different reason. Because I could exploit you with that advice. It'll be good for me, so I give it to you. So that's why society needed Brahmins. Because if there weren't Brahmins, then the ruling class would tend to exploit people. Have you noticed that? Those of you from South Africa, you saw the change from Nelson Mandela to whoever else came in, right? The Nelson Mandela would get paid and he'd look at the paycheck and he says, I don't need all this money, and he'd give it to charity, right? Unlike your current president, or prime minister, what is it? Prime? President, yeah. I was in Nairobi and I found out that the, um, the members of parliament make $250,000 a month. U.S. dollars. A month. Where are you from? I'm from Canada. Oh. By the way, 250 k a month. Yeah, they told me, the, the, they told me the members of parliament make 250000 a month. And I said, well, the members of Congress in America make more than that. And they said, no, that's, no, they said they make 250000 I thought it was a year. So I said, well, America, they make more. And he said, no, it's a month. So, you know, you know what it's like, right? So, I'm leading in to explain why Christmas is the way it is. So, if you have a class of men that have no interest in anything but people, they can control the men who would tend to have an interest in something other than people, like an interest in themselves. So if they obey them, they work under their guidance, society maintains its stability and purity because you need a class of men that look after the welfare of others, that have the most power, right? If the power goes into the hands of someone who's selfish, then everybody suffers. And we see that, right? Isn't it? That's kind of obvious. So. When Kali Yuga began, Kali came to Prikrit Maharaj and said, Prikrit Maharaj said, out of here, out of my kingdom. And Kali said, give me some place to go. He said, okay, you can go where there's gold, intoxication, sex and gambling. In other words, Las Vegas. But Las Vegas hadn't been created yet. So then he said, can you make it a little easier? Just give me like one place. And he said, well, or like how do I find that? Or what's, this, what's you know, how do I get there? He said, well, just find wherever gold, wherever they're hoarding gold, and then there'll be illicit sex, intoxication, and gambling automatically. So he was just, so basically, Las Vegas. Anyone have been to Las Vegas? I was just in Las Vegas. Uh, when was I there? In August, I think. August or September, yeah. We were building a temple there. Do you know that? In Las Vegas. What? In Las Vegas, we built a temple. They're building a temple in Las Vegas, and it's such a big thing that in the Times of India, or one magazine in India, they wrote an article, that ISKCON is building a temple in Las Vegas. It was such a big thing for them. There was some Hungarian... No, now it's Indians and Americans. There were some Eastern Europeans, but they left. Um, maybe. So anyway, um, so Kali rule, rules in Kali Yuga, right? He rules the show. And Kali Yuga is all about money. That's on everyone's mind. It's what everybody thinks about. Even the people that say money is not important, they think about it also. Because everybody's, <coughs> everybody's obsessed with it. <coughs> so, when <coughs> you don't have Brahmins, then the ruling class is free to exploit. And when the ruling class exploits, what do the people do? They revolt. But because Kali Yuga is all about money, who ends up ruling? 
The capitalist. Capitalist control, right? Who controls the world? The kings or the corporations? The banks or the presidents? Yeah, the people with the most money control. Right? So what you see in today in society is a society controlled by Vaishyas, mercantile people. That's why they take a religious holiday and they say, hey, we could make money out of this. Isn't it? That's, that's what it means. Capitalism means how you could make money out of any opportunity. And that's, on, that's considered honorable. Not only honorable, it's considered glorious. Um, the most, um, there was a Fortune 500 India version two years ago or three years ago. The greatest, you know, like 25 men. And 80% were businessmen. The others were movie stars and sportsmen. Those are the Mahajans, the greats. In a sense, that's just businessmen anyway. Maybe stars in schools. Yeah, yeah, because they're wealthy, yeah. So, Christmas is about taking something religious, putting it in the hands of the capitalists, and turning it into a money-making opportunity. Do you know that businesses make more money in December than they do? I mean, retail sales makes more money in December than they make the whole year maybe double. That one month you make double what you make the other 11 months. Did you know that? Yeah, I actually used to work for um, like a consumer goods company and we made chocolate and um, Christmas and Valentine's were the two. Yeah, exactly. So they could make the most amount of money. Yeah. So that's a little insight on Christmas. Christmas is a it's an example of something that gets in the wrong hands and they turn it into a money-making program. And now everyone views Christmas as a... How do they view it? According to the way the capitalists have directed them to view it. She mentioned Valentine's Day. Where did that come from? Yeah, so take a saint and turn him into a money-making machine. You're supposed to give gifts on Valentine's Day. You're supposed to give gifts on Christmas. What verse is that in the Bible? But it's good for business. Right? Yeah, so that's... Now, just a little insight from Prabhupada's perspective on um, Jesus Christ. Prabhupada always, uh, used to glorify him, particularly in relationship to tolerance, because he forgave those who were killing him. So he was, he, he exemplified tolerance, he exemplified forgiveness. So Prabhupada would often refer to him that way. And he often showed great respect whenever discussions of Jesus came up. He would really show great respect for him, for his sacrifice, his devotion. Hmm. Is that okay? Anybody have anything else to say about Christmas? I was speaking to my son yesterday. He's actually awful don't do the Christmas thing. Um, but I was telling him that it's that one, the six loving exchanges, if you take it on the yeah, yeah. view level and but use, you know, he said pretty much similar to what you said. Yeah. You know. Well, it's kind of amazing how it's just grabbed the world. Yeah. It's like 11 months they can abuse and neglect those people close to them and they're like, let me give you something and make up. Yeah. Not being there because You know, there's this story of um, a Grihasta 
that comes to see Gorgeshwar Das Babaji and says, I just want to serve you, I want to be like you, and so forth. And then he says, well, just stay here, don't go home. Just stay here and chant. Move in with me under my tree. And then he ran away. So it was a good feeling. I want to be pure, right? like the good mood. But when it actually came down to what you had to do, he ran away. So if you study the teachings of Jesus, requires he, he asked for a lot of surrender. He said very, very um, strong things. Like, if somebody slaps you in the cheek, then give them the other cheek. Which means tolerate it, and if they, if they want to vent their ill feelings, don't fight back. Let them. That's who could do that. If that was a requirement to join a church, would there be any church members? They'd be empty. Say, why is your church empty? Well, we decided to require people to follow the Bible, and then we realized nobody could follow it. Okay, here's my theory. You want to hear my theory? Maybe I should write a book and become famous. But if I write it, I might be killed by the Christians. But this is, this is how my theory goes. The teachings of Jesus are very strict. And your average John Smith or Jan Smuts or Joe Patel is not going to do a good job following them. Because he said... If you look at a woman with lust, that's the same as committing adultery. That's heavy, isn't it? It's like very, very strict, right? So, very few people can follow. You find this in ISKCON sometimes. It's like when people can't follow, they, they, some people say, Prabhupada was impractical or idealistic or something. You know, nobody can follow. So you could imagine thousands of years ago, people trying to follow Jesus, looking at his teachings, give the other cheek, you're an adulterer if you lusted a woman and so forth, whatever else he taught that was very strict. And people looking at that and thinking, nobody can follow this. So if nobody can follow it, the next question is, why did he teach it? Like, what did he mean? Why would he give teachings what we as humans can't follow? you ever wonder? Even in Krishna consciousness? It's like, you know, can this spread? There's so many people have such a difficult time following. So you could imagine. Prabhupada was very lenient. Jesus was very strict. So you could imagine, they're all sitting around, they're trying to figure out, they're looking at one another and saying, do you follow these teachings? Some of them. What about you? can't follow all of them. What about and they're going around the room and these are the people whose hands Christianity is going to go forward in and they're trying to understand what did he mean because none of us can follow them the teachings very well. And then they realize that those teachings weren't meant for them to be followed because nobody can follow them. That would make sense, right? Let's say it's the year 2,500, we're all sitting here in Mayapur, and not one of us is able to follow all the regular principles and chant 16 rounds, and we're having a meeting, and you're thinking, that must just have been for Prabhupada's disciples and the next generations. There's no way in this year, 2,500 in Kali Yuga, it's so fallen, we're so much more fallen than they were then, we can't follow. <coughs> that, much, that must mean that Prabhupada really didn't intend that we follow. Does that make sense? No, it's getting degraded. 500 more years. Just wait. You think the music sounds bad now, wait for 500 years. In fact, I call it factory music. It's machines, right? Mm -hmm. Machines going. They had a commercial for a car he starts the engine. Vroom, vroom. They sample that. That means they record it. They open the door. They sample that. They close the door. They sample that. 
and they go, hum, they sample that and they make a beat out of it. Hum. So that was their beat, it's just like a factory. Slamming doors, starting engines. Anyway, don't worry. There may be some golden part to the age, but there'll definitely be an iron part. Definitely it'll be there. So, they're all sitting around, they're thinking, what did Jesus mean? And someone gets an idea. Well, actually, Jesus said that everyone's going to hell unless they accept him. So, those instructions Jesus gave were like what he lived his life by. That was what he lives his life by, but not what we live our life by. And knowing that we can't live our life that way, and we're so fallen, he gave his mercy, and he just said, if you accept me in your heart, you're free from sins. And that's how you'll gain salvation, because in this age, it's not the age of law anymore, it's the age of mercy. So we can't follow the law. You know, the Old Testament was law, the New Testament they, they said it's a new era, you don't follow the law, you get mercy. So they extended that so far to mercy that you don't really have to follow much. I mean, you try, you do your best, but if you fail, as long as you accept Jesus, you're okay, if you're somewhat moral. So then they realized that actually what Jesus meant is you can't follow and the only way to be saved is to be accepted by him, pray for him to save you. And then once you're saved, then you've got your visa, you've got your ticket, you're on your way to heaven. Right? The other material concept is when you get to heaven, grandma, Fido, your brother, sister, mother, aunt, uncle, cousins, they're all going to be there. Which, if that were the case, I think a lot of people wouldn't want to go. Yeah. I mean, I left home when I was 18 to get away from all of them. I don't want to meet them up there. No, up there they'll be nice. You mean Grandma will be 87 years old with gray hair and wrinkles in heaven? Well, I feel sorry for her. And if that's the case, I should die when I'm like 22, because then I'll be in heaven forever at 22. So material ideas enter and they start putting two and two together and come up with five or six or eight or twelve and you create this religion that um, has done one of the greatest disservices to humanity by convincing people who are, who are, that they're going this way when they're actually going this way. You ask me, where's the Goshala? I go, Goshala's down here. Well, it's over there. And you go that way and I laugh at you. <laughs> or I don't know where the ghost shell is and I say it's down there, but it's over here. It's a disservice. So they're sending people down by telling them they're going up and they all believe they're going up and they're going down. Yes? You agree? It's such a disservice. Theologically, they... Practically, more moralistically, welfare-wise, they do service, but theologically, they do a disservice. Like a really big disservice. And the other disservice they do is they turn people away from the Hare Krishnas. They say the Hare Krishnas are demons of the devil, and there's, if you go with the Hare Krishna, you go to hell. Okay. I hope Jesus appreciates this. I, mean, I, just, I have to say these things because I've had to deal with these people for 47 years on the street and it's like, I think about these things. Now, another, one of the most interesting fallacies and dichotomies and paradoxes of Christianity is the idea that if you don't accept Jesus, you will go to hell. Okay, that's bad enough. You know, it's like your father says, do you accept me as your only savior? I don't know. To hell with you. You have to accept me as your savior. So, okay. You know, if you don't accept God, in a sense, 
you could be considered sinful and go to hell. But what happens when you go to hell? Who knows what happens in hell? There's no cure to it. That's hell. That's hell for us. Right? No, it's much worse than that. There's no rascoolas. That's also hell. There's no halava. That's also hell. No mangalarti. Well, for some of you, that would be a blessing. You don't have to get up a little. But what happens in hell, according to them, is there's a fire, and you're thrown in the fire. But there's one problem. You burn, but your body doesn't burn. So you're burning forever. Do you know that? That's hell. You burn, but you don't die. Forever. For eternity you're burning. Right? Is that the... There are people who grew up as kids learning this that have psychological disorders because the preachers were so heavy. One person told me they have in their church one side for the saved and one side for the unsaved. So they could preach to the unsaved, you're going to hell. So some people would joke and I'd say, what's your religion? He'd say, I'm a recovering Baptist. And I've just been psychologically damaged by being told that I'll burn forever in hell because you know, I left my Baptist church and went to the Catholic church or vice versa, whatever. Right, so, what's the paradox? In this age, according to the Christian, it's, you are saved by grace, not by acts. Not by works alone, but by grace. Okay, so that means God's love is what saves you. God is love, God's love saves you. And, if you don't believe in Him, He loves you so much, He'll send you to hell to burn forever. Does that make sense? Raise your hand if that makes sense. If that makes sense, you must be really tired. That's all I can say. So, <laughs> now, imagine Galena here got mad at her child because her child uh, wouldn't obey her. So she decided to tie her child to a stake and put a certain kind of fuel on her child that burns her child, but the body doesn't burn, just fire. What would you think of her? Would you report her to the police? Maybe you'd report her to a mental hospital. So now they're ascribing acts to God that even a very uncultured uncivilized person wouldn't do. Is that crazy? Or is that crazy? You understand? Isn't that crazy when you think about it? And they don't realize that, how crazy it is. They believe it. Because human nature can conceive and concoct a philosophy to make everything work. So now we, we believe and we go to heaven. And if you don't believe, you go to hell. And if you don't believe, you're of the devil. Because the devil will try to take you away from Jesus. So if you follow another religion, you're of the devil. Even though you don't eat meat, you don't take drugs, you don't go to Las Vegas, you're chaste, you're clean, you sing God's name, you're of the devil. Now, I have personally heard uh, on the radio pastors talking to their congreg congregations about the great sex life they have with their wives. More than one pastor. Why do they do that? Make it sound normal. Because they believe that's God's gift. Well, Sense gratification is God's gift. He wants you to enjoy. So they describe the glories of God's gift and that's one of them and they Talk about it. Yeah, it's, yeah, it, it's more pervade. These kinds of things are more pervasive than you realize. So, all I can say is we're very fortunate to be under the shelter of Prabhupada. 
don't you think? Because Prabhupada did not cheat us. Prabhupada was coming in a disciplic section, six section. He was giving us the truth. He had no desire to gain any get anything with us, and he understood clearly what is materialism and what is spirituality. Yes? Yes? See? Perfecto. Okay. Should we read about Dhammada? We've heard enough about Jesus, right? Now the last thing is, they don't know when Jesus was born, so it's not today, I can tell you. They think this day was actually the day the Gita was spoken, but some people say. But Jesus wasn't born today. They just they made up a date. They did because they don't know. Some of the some of the expert scholars have suggested February is more like the day. Mm. And some of the people who have studied this life and, and, and all the testaments and indications from whatever the theory could be the more logical mm -hmm. yeah. On a morning walk, they asked Prabhupada about the Bible, and he made the comment that, you know, Vedic literature is handed down, guru to disciple. So the original source is Krishna or Brahma, or some in incarnation, or Krishna himself. So it's passed down. So nobody has to make up anything. The so Prabhupada said that the Bible was written by people who had limitations. The sages who compiled and spoke the Vedas were beyond these limitations. So he said that so many things in the Bible were concocted. So, of course, if something's true, we can accept it. But so many things were not. Prabhupada didn't believe were transcendental. At least, obviously, the interpretations are not. So that was one thing he said. Another thing he said was, in the Bible it says no one has seen God. So that would, you know, it, if you say you've seen God or you know what God looks like, they would take that as heretical. Um, because it's against the Bible. And Prabhupada said, no fool has seen God. But I am not a fool. And I have seen God. Some people would ask Prabhupada, have you seen God? And he would say, if I say yes, what will that do for you? If I say yes, how will you know? If you don't even know what God is, how will you know? Yes, I'm seeing God at every moment. Can you see God? Yes, every moment. One of the artists said, Prabhupada, is the Paramatma sitting or standing? They'd ask, all these, ask Prabhupada all these questions because they wanted to make sure everything would come out right. And Prabhupada closed his eyes for a minute. Then he said, he's standing. <laughs> What do you think of that? Is that good? Hmm. And the Prabhupada was very concerned. He was very concerned about so-called religionists, so-called scientists, so-called philosophers. Because they had so much authority and people so readily believed them. So that's why sometimes he was very strong. Yes? If you ever see Prabhupada strong, it's generally because he's dealing with a situation where people are being misled. 
And sometimes he would say, don't be cheated, don't be so foolish, don't be so naive to believe all these things. Okay, you ready for more? Hmm. 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 No matter what Rohini cooks, your whimsical son will not eat it because it's not been served by you. This is Nanda Maharaj asking Jasoda to come out and feed Krishna. Jasoda's eyes welled with tears, her heart flooded with bliss. The symptoms of ecstasy danced in every limb of her body. A golden effulgence covered the hall. It appeared the entire palace was transformed into a realm of love. Everything seemed composed of Jasoda's love. Because what was happening, she had, she'd been in a room for three days. She wasn't associating, and now this, this was an opportunity to express her affection, being away from everyone. And now, having resolved all the difficulties with Krishna and the bad feelings for tying him up. Her love had been restricted, now it was coming out. So, just like feeling up, her love was filling up the whole place, like white light. Mm. In everyone's heart, they felt an upsurge of love. A love they'd never known before. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Everyone was feeling like Mother Yasoda because at that point they had Mother Yasoda's love. It was just pervading everything and they were all getting it. Would you like to be there? Wow. Do you imagine getting that just for like a minute? That could destroy your material life forever. Because material life means we go on with the hope of getting pleasure from something other than Krishna. Right? Isn't it? Isn't that the definition of material life? It means we think there's pleasure somewhere other than Krishna. Right? Someone's asking, is Krishna the son of God? No, Christ is the son of Krishna. Yeah. If you could get the love that was describing, described here for one minute, do you think you'd ever have attachment or desire for anything material? Raise your hand if you think you would. This would be it, it'd be finished. Because in comparison to whatever we're getting in the material world. This love would outdo it a million times. And you wouldn't be interested in anything. Else. So any problem we have is just means we don't have love of Krishna. Because if we did, we wouldn't have a problem. Imagine you had love of Krishna like this. And you came home and there was nothing to eat. Would that be a problem? Somebody stole your plate and ate your lunch. Would that be a problem? I don't think so. You know when people are in love, they don't have problems. Did you ever notice? When you're in love, you don't have problems.
Okay. So as we said yesterday, she was feeding Krishna. Now Krishna was eating. And Krishna was now known as Damodar. You have to get the book. Then you'll then all the hums, hmm, you can read. <laughs> By submitting himself to the loving whims of the gopis, Krishna made known that he is absolutely controlled by the Brajbasis by their unconstrained affection. He exhibited pastimes that confound even the residents of Ayodhya. What to speak of the denizens of Aikunta or the material planets? Whenever guests would come, Krishna would stop or look up from his play to see whether the caller had brought gifts. And they did, but gifts for which Krishna would have to first display some enchantment. A gopi guest would show a tray of sweets and say, Oh, Gopal, look at these sweets. Krishna would answer, May I have one? To which she would reply, You may have them all. But first you have to equal the hard work I put into them. What must I do? Dance for us, and I shall give you a half a manohar ladu. Why only half? Why not a whole one? Dear boy, if you dance nicely, you will get the other half. One is for effort, and the other is for quality. Hare Krishna. Krishna nodded his head, and as the gopis clapped their hands, he tried to imitate the professional dancers of his father's court. Would you like to be there watching? What do you think would happen if you were there? to your heart. You know, you ever heard this saying, my heart melted? What does that mean? In spiritual terms, it melts in love of Krishna. It said, my heart melted on the pot of attraction. That's a verse from Bhagavatam. I think it's Narada Muni. My heart melted on the pot of attraction. You ever see a little cute boy, like really cute? Raise your hand, you've seen a really cute boy? Like especially like, oh my God, cute? Like, multiply that a million times, and that's one drop of the attraction, of the beauty of Krishna. And imagine seeing somebody that beautiful, what would that do to you? Probably faint. You'd scream, you'd faint, you'd roll on the ground. Right? Don't you think? You ever have this experience, like you'll see something, a like beautiful art or a beautiful movie, or you'll hear music that's just like incredibly good. It just turns your emotions, and you, you just can't express it. It's like, it's just like, how did they do it this good? Or a joke that's so funny, you can't imagine anyone had a brain that could come up with that. Or a plot in a story that's so amazingly complicated and intricate and things connect and you just you become overwhelmed. You ever have that experience? Or you see some Hollywood model that looks like they, they're an Apsara from another planet and you're like, how could any woman be that beautiful? It's like, 
It's like, you know, one out of a million like that. You just, now multiply that a million times. And you get some un understanding of a drop of Krishna. And so you can imagine what it's like to be in his presence. Well, you can't really imagine, but you can, you can have fun trying to imagine. You know, it says that the cowherd women, they all had sons, but they loved Krishna more than their son. you imagine your mother loved the neighbor more than you? Would that drive you crazy? That is abnormal, unless the neighbor is Krishna. So how attractive does someone have to be that you're more attracted to them than your own kid? You love them more than your own child. Isn't that interesting? Yeah? Yes? Mm -hmm. Krishna was the picture of childhood innocence. His awkward movements <clears throat> drew his gopi audience into the ocean of loving mellows. And while he remained aware of the movement of every atom of his creation, he simultaneously forgot it all in the behavior and identity of a little boy. So Krishna loses his identity as God. He goes into the, the mood of a little boy, forgets he's God, but the whole creation is still intact and everything's working. That's interesting, isn't it? You can completely forget he's God, but not lose touch with the maintenance of the creation. It's still, everything's working. He was God, but by the love of his devotees, he thought that he was a little boy, another child of a coward village. And the Vajabazis were ignorant of his opulence, so was he. So we had discussed the other day, or last week, I think, how Krishna forgets he's God in proportion to the love of his devotees. And when there's love, he totally forgets. So he forgets everything about his godhood, everything that may have happened in the past that he did as God, he forgets. And it just, it's just his love, that's it. He's overcome by his love, by that love. And that's why all the Brajvasis forget Krishna. Who he is, is because it's love. So love just completely covers them. So if, if anyone ever asks you, how is it that Krishna can forget his God? The answer is because of the love of his devotees. Because they're not loving him as God, they're loving him as a little boy. So that causes him to forget that he's God. Mother Yasoda doesn't want to breastfeed God. She wants to breastfeed her little boy. The gopis don't want to dance with God. They want to dance with Krishna. Right? So everybody's forgetting. Still the creation is moving forward. Hmm. So now Krishna's trying to dance. He's three years old and the gopis want him to dance. So he's, he's trying to dance like He's seeing the older ladies, but he's making a mess of it. He's trying to do it, but he really can't do it well. And he gets confused. They said, try again, try again. And so he'd get up and he'd try again. And then he'd try to sing and dance. He couldn't really dance, he couldn't really sing that they would applaud him. And then he finally started to be able to dance, coordinate his singing and dancing, 
and then everyone's heart just melted. So he was just like a little boy trying to do all this. Would you like to go and see that? Yeah, well you have to pay for it, it's expensive. You don't get it by laying in bed in the morning. These are expensive tickets. You want to get this and This is the reward for Krishna consciousness. The reward is you get to love Krishna. And there's nothing more valuable than that. The Beatles said it, money can't buy me love. Everyone's trying to get money, but money can't buy you love. <laughs> Maybe one day we'll give a class based on popular songs. We'll sing the song and then we'll give the purport. Money can't buy me love, I can't get no satisfaction. Wherever you go, this is the Gopi song, wherever you go, whatever you do, I'll be right here waiting for you. And um, Linda Ronstadt, the famous, um, she answered the question, um, why doesn't God force you to love him? And her lyrics of her song is, I can't make you love me if you don't. I can't make your heart feel something you want. So the whole philosophy is out there in popular music. Could, could do a whole course on that. You know that song? Famous song in America. That's the chorus. I can't make you love me if you don't. It's like, you know, trying to get this guy to love her. I can't make you love me if you don't. I can't make your heart feel something at won't. It's exactly what Krishna says. When Krishna left Vrindavan, what did the gopis say? Richard Marks, he sang his famous song. Wherever you go, whatever, you, wherever you go, whatever you do, I'll be right here waiting for you. That's what the gopis said. So all the emotions are there in the perverted reflection, aren't they? Separation, oceans apart, day after day. It's like all the perversion. So if you want to see Krishna trying to dance and falling over and sing and melting your heart, you want a front row seat? Those are expensive. You got to pay for that. But if you get that, that's the, it's worth it. And whenever, I wonder what he was writing to me today and she was saying, I'm, I'm losing my enthusiasm. Whenever you lose your enthusiasm, you have to know, you have to look at the prize. Because the prize is, it's expensive. And sometimes we lose enthusiasm because it's expensive. Right? God, this is so expensive, I don't know if I can afford it. I don't know if I can work that hard to get that much money. But I have to have this. You just have to keep looking at it. You keep you have to understanding what it is you're going to get. So that gives you the impetus. It's, it's worth it to get up, to chant my rounds, to do Sankirtan, to do whatever I have to do. It's worth it because this is what you get and you can't get it any other way. And this is the prize. And this is what we've been looking for for a million lifetimes. And you can get it in this life. And that's why we hear these stories, to impel us, to inspire us, to want to get it. Because otherwise, if we're not inspired by this, it's just going to be money. Because money's the honey. It's going to be money, possessions, power, control. Right? What else is left in the material world? Maybe some service mixed in there that may be there for some people. Surfing, yeah. Surfing, the highest pleasure in the material world. But it, um, it doesn't control you like sex. You could live without surfing, but you could. Yeah, but still, they couldn't live without sex. You know, if the waves are bad, they won't surf, they won't, they won't go crazy. In Florida, I moved to Florida 10 years ago, and there's hardly any surf there. So you have to wait, like sometimes months, to get any good waves. So they just wait, they can live without it. But they can't live without sex. 
sex is more biological than surgery. Yes? When you say that um, the surgery is more biological than surgery, that means that the surgery is more biological than surgery? Yes. When you say that um, the prize is expensive because we have to do certain things, like a certain lifestyle, um, but it's not, this is not the most expensive process, right? Because it's relatively easy what we're doing on show program has given us to other ways to potentially achieve the goal, right? Because it's almost like when you say it's expensive, it's like a negative connotation, right? Because expensive, it's not, it doesn't have like the same meaning as the price is valuable. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, I was comparing it to material life. But what you say is true compared to other spiritual processes. But we didn't come from other spiritual processes. We came from material life. So that's why I was comparing it. So no, but Prabhupada did say it's easy compared to other spiritual processes. It's inexpensive. But compared to material life, it's expensive because you have to make sacrifice. You have to pay. What do you have to pay with? Your austerity, your steadiness. You have to give up a lot. So that, that sense of expensive. So, I don't know if it's a negative, it depends how you look at it. No, that clarified my question. Yeah. I wasn't thinking expensive yeah. compared to material. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that sometimes devotees, they kind of give up. They say, I don't have any impetus to go on. Seems a bit beyond reach sometimes. Seems a bit beyond reach. Yeah. But if you read these pastimes and realize you can get there if you just keep, keep at it. I mean, okay, maybe it seems out of reach, but what, what are your choices? If you don't go for this, what are your choices? Buddhist. But yeah, all right. You become a Buddhist, but you're still going to get old. And doing, you know, 10 hours a day of silent meditation is not exactly easy. Or six hours, whatever. But I was thinking, you know, alternatives to um, material alternatives. Okay, you don't do this. What's your what do you get if you don't do this? What are your choices? What can you achieve? Wealth and fame. Wealth and fame for another, and how many more years you're going to live? So, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, you know. Think of all the enjoyment you've had in your life. Just think about all the great times you've had. And how much of that enjoyment are you experiencing right now? In many ways, you're experiencing negative consequences of it. Because it might have burned you out. Right? So that, that's the nature of material enjoyment. You enjoy it, but the next day, week, year, you don't have anything to show for it. There's no, there's no, there's no experience of it. It's an interesting thing, though, in the old you get put into context as experiences. And you see, it's less valuable than you did when you were youthful. And yet they were all, they were all and everything when you were youthful. Yeah. But then in context, you can see they're almost like they were nothing. Even without Krishna consciousness, you can talk about Yeah. Um, because, because when you're in the moment, you have an itch to do something. So because you have the itch, if you scratch it, it feels good. There's no itch, and then you're older, you don't have the itch anymore. So that's really what material life is, scratching an itch. It's just, it's not that it's making you happy, it's just relieving something. Because I was stupid, foolish, spiritually weak, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, so these are these are two ideas. You hear about Krishna, that, that makes you realize, or you hear about the great devotees, that makes you realize, this is what I can get in this lifetime. This is amazing. I can get this. That serves as an impetus, and also to think, what are my options if I don't do this? What am I going to get? 
So, okay, maybe I'll get a nice family, a nice house, all these things, and, and that's okay. But my question would be, then what? Now that you have it, then what? Because that's not going to do it for you. You're going to be asking yourself the same question. After you get it, okay, now what do I do? I've got it. And you're going to realize that's not where it's at. So we have to think like that. Want to hear a great story? I just heard this story um, in the summer. As I was staying in Las Vegas in a huge, huge house, a devotee owned in a beautiful neighborhood. And I called my sister and I said, I'm in such and such neighborhood in Las Vegas. And she said, oh, our cousin used to live there. And he bought a house when houses were very inexpensive. They would only like three, four hundred thousand. Looks like a million, a couple of million dollar home. And then the price went up, like 600000 800000 because real estate prices were shooting up, especially in Las Vegas. And then after 2008, it crashed. And he walked out on it. He couldn't even afford it. He was, used to live in Beverly Hills. You all know about Beverly Hills, right? It's one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Los Angeles. So that's where he lived for like 10, 20, 30 years. Then he semi-retired, moved to Las Vegas bought a house for like a fourth of the price what it would cost in Beverly Hills and like three times bigger. And he's got to walk out of the house, you know. That's not the end of it. He sold his business and he sold it to a guy who was actually his competitor. So anyway, he sold the business and they made some deal that the guy would pay it off in time. And the guy went bankrupt. So he sold his business, which is how he's going to retire, and the guy never paid him, or he paid him a fraction. And now he's living in a two-bedroom apartment in the valley in Los Angeles. So, you know, you might say, I'm going to make it. But, you know, a few things happen and it's all over. Isn't that interesting? He's living in a two-bedroom apartment and he's trying to sell some insurance or something just to make a little extra money. It's like, so you don't know. You just don't know what's going to happen. Right? You're in South Africa. These poor white boys, poor white trash. In South Africa, it's super hard for them to get a job because all the jobs go to the blacks, right? They may never get a good job in their whole life. And if they do, they may have to work like seven days a week, 20 hours a day. Other guys will go, well, otherwise. We'll hire somebody else and you won't get a job, isn't it? Right? It wasn't like that in the 80s. I was there in the 80s. It's completely different. So everything's great. All the white people, very wealthy, we've got the best jobs. Huh? Change the government, everything changes. It's all over. Everything's changed. So that's the way the world is, you just don't know. So even if you say, I want to just have a beautiful life, but how do you know it's going to work? And if it works, how do you know it's going to last? What, what is the worst thing that could happen? One of the worst things. Your children die. Would that be like the worst, like, like, especially if they're young? I mean, does it happen sometimes that children die? Sometimes happens. And what do you think? You think I feel so sorry for the parents because you know it's practically intolerable. Isn't it? Like, how can you live? Right? It's possible it happens. So you know, you you want to set everything up perfectly, but. You don't know what's going to happen. You just don't know. And so Prabhupada is trying to convince us of that. He said, take the Krishna consciousness because it'll solve all your problems because you'll, you'll get out of here. It's like going into a nice warm house when it's cold outside. 
Okay. Is that too depressing a way to end the class? Mahatma Prabhu, you're so negative. I was talking about how bad it is. The only reason we talk about how bad it is is because we're all so dull. That we don't get it. Isn't it? Like when you understand it's bad, you can engage in devotional service very easily because you're not, you're not looking for something else. But when you think there's something else, then you get devious. Well, I don't know. What about this? What about that? There were so many devotees that wanted to do many, many things, and Prabhupada just said, don't do them. Just go straight back to Krishna. Just focus on what's most essential. Is that okay? Even if it isn't okay, it's the way it is. Right? (laughs) Even if you don't like (coughs) the people say, oh, you Hare Krishnas, you're so negative. I say, we're not negative, we're just honest. <coughs> it's not negative, it's just, that's the way it is. You can see it negative or positive. I don't see it negative, I see it positive. It's just the way it is, and I know you don't want to hear about the way it is, because the way it is is not so great, because you want to kind of think it's not like that. And that's what's so good about it being a devotee, is that we're not running away from it, we're talking about it, we're not making believe it's not like that. Because that is actually our impetus for Krishna consciousness, to face it, right? That's what gives us impetus. You know, one time here in Mayapur, really funny, it was 1975, and Prabhupada came back from a morning walk, and when he would come back, we would gather around to ask the devotees who went on the morning walk, what did he say? Wouldn't you do that? Prabhupada just came back from morning walk. Wouldn't you want to know what he said? So they said, Prabhupada said there's going to be a world war. World War Three. That was like heavy. Like when? You know, the pure devotee who can see the future is predicting this. Whoa. So anyway, we found out, or I heard, I later heard that one. The one devotee, one leader was saying, well, what should we do? Because he was fearing that cities would be destroyed, temples and devotees would be destroyed. And Prabhupada could see that, he was very concerned. And Prabhupada laughed at him. Srila Prabhupada, what should we do? Where should we move the temples? Where should we do, you know? And Prabhupada was kind of laughing and said, oh, you were thinking you weren't gonna die? Like, you know, we could turn that into California surfer talk. Dude. Hello. You thinking you're not going to die? Duh. That's basically what Prabhupada was saying. And then Prabhupada said, It's so funny. There's so many things that Prabhupada said you can translate into California surfer talk. And it's just like, you can see that's exactly what he's saying. But of course he wouldn't say it that way. You know, but he's basically saying, duh, you didn't think you were going to die? Where you been? So <laughs> Prabhupada said, you're going to die in a day or you're going to die in 10 years? What's, like, what's the difference? And of course, from our perspective, it's like, what do you mean? I'm a young man. I have my whole life ahead of me. But you could see what Prabhupada's saying is, you're not ready to die now. <clears throat> you're not going to be ready when you're 85. You're never going to be ready. You either die an hour in 50 years, you know, you're not ready, you're not ready. Well, you know, it's like, you're going to die, you've been die, dying a million lifetimes, it's like, what's your problem? So he was thinking, Prabhupada was like, then another devotee told me a story, he was on an airplane with Prabhupada, <clears throat> and the airplane went straight down. <clears throat> just like, you ever been in, can you imagine being on an airplane, just goes straight down like a rocket ship, like a helicopter? It'd be kind of scary, right? And the devotee told me, he said, I was like completely frightened because I thought we're going to crash. And then after they got on the plane, off the plane, because he wasn't sitting next to Prabhupada, and he asked Prabhupada, you know, you know, when the plane went down, like, were you worried? And Prabhupada just laughed. He said, no, were you? 
But he was completely frightened out of his mind. So, I mean, that's how Prabhupada was. He was blunt, he was straightforward, these are realities, and he would talk about them. When he was dying, he looked at us and said, don't, don't think you won't go through this. Don't think you won't get old and die. Because he knows that we're thinking, I won't get old and die. Right? So he talks about it. And you have to be of a certain consciousness to be able to hear it. Because it's not always pleasant. Who wants to hear it? You can't be happy in the material world. Is that, is that a good message for Christmas? And we all say, Bhagavad Gita, it's the most amazing book. It's just incredible, you've got to read it. And what does it say in Bhagavad Gita? Wherever you go, from Brahma Loka down, it's all a place of misery. That's what it says. And we don't even want to hear that. But that's Bhagavad Gita. That is our book. Yeah, but not that verse. <laughs> no, but that's there. Not only is it there, Krishna is saying, Darshanam, you should see it. You shouldn't run away from it. You should see birth, old age, disease, dukkha, doshana, darshanam. You should see those. Janma, mitya, jara, yadi, dukkha, doshana, dharma. You should see the miseries of birth, old age, disease, and death. You should take darshan of them. You should see them. Does it mean you get a skull, a skull, you know, a skull, and put it in your room and meditate on it? But you should see these things. So that's, that helps us, even though it's not pleasant, because it's just real, right? Okay, if I talk anymore, you'll be completely depressed. <laughs> so I will now become silent. Uh, tomorrow we're going to have a class at 245 out in the Grihast area, and we're going to try to talk about um, stage of love called asakti, when you become attached to Krishna. And it's a little bit esoteric, but it's um, useful to know what love is and what it looks like and how it develops. And it, it acts like this acts. It, it develops a desire to want to achieve it. And as you were saying, sometimes it seems like we're never going to get there. But I can guarantee if you give up, you're never going to get there. And if you keep going, there is a chance. In one life or another, you will get there. A very good chance. Okay? So thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Hari Hari